Welcome to this call where we will be sharing the new 48 state energy policy simulator models. If you could take a second and just introduce yourself in the chat, let us know what state you're calling in from. That way we can have a good sense of what states are represented on this call. So I'm Sarah Spengeman. I'm the Deputy Communications Director at Energy Innovation. Oh, I see the chat for participants is disabled. We will get that fixed in one second. Um, apologies. So we have been working on this project with RMI for the past two years, and it is wonderful to finally be able to share these powerful tools with all of you. We're really optimistic about the way this model can empower bold climate policy. So thank you again for joining us. In case you're unfamiliar, RMI is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization of experts across disciplines working to accelerate the clean energy transition and improve lives. And Energy Innovation Policy and Technology is a nonpartisan energy and environmental policy firm. We deliver high quality research and original analysis to policymakers to help them make inform, informed choices on energy policy. Uh, before we get started, a few logistics. So the call is being recorded and we will share the recording with anyone who registered. We'll hold Q&A to the end, but you should see at the bottom a Q&A box. Oh, people are putting where they are from in the Q&A. I see you're already making use of it, that's great. So that's where you can pop your questions in throughout the presentations and you can actually vote questions up. You'll see a little thumb um, icon that you can click on and if you really, if you have the same question or you really wanna make sure that question gets answered, go ahead and vote up questions. And then it, um, we'll get to all those questions at the end. And I am really now happy to be able to introduce our panelists, uh, Olivia Ashmore from Energy Innovation and Nathan Iyer from RMI, who've been working on this project from the very beginning. And both of them, I'm sure, can't believe that we're finally actually launching this. It's really exciting. So first, we're going to hear from Olivia. Uh, she's a policy analyst on Energy Innovation's mod modeling and analysis team. And she's going to provide an overview of the energy policy simulator model and a quick demo. And then we're going to turn it over to Nathan from RMI, who's a senior associate in the US program working on state and federal climate policy. And Nathan is gonna discuss new research using the state models and highlighting the most impactful state policies and really helping you all see the power of this tool. So without further ado, I'm gonna now pass it over to Olivia. Hopefully you all can see my screen. Um... Like Sarah said, thank you for the introduction. I'm Olivia Ashmore. Um, I'm a policy analyst at Energy Innovation. And in this presentation, I'm gonna walk through how to use the online web tool and give an overview of the structure of the state EPS models. Then I'm going to hand it over to Nathan, who's going to talk about the release of the state EPS models and different state uses. The U.S. Energy Policy Simulator was originally developed by Energy Innovation and released in 2015. And since then, it's been used to effectively analyze the potential impact of U.S. climate policies. This has included um, the U.S. House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis using it, and we used it to model the 2022 impacts of the IRA. RMI and EI came together to adapt this tool for states and the EPS is really designed to help drive state climate action with unbiased data supported analysis. The EPS can help policymakers understand which policies will be most effective at reducing emissions and help them put together a package of policies that will allow them to meet their greenhouse gas reduction goals. The model can also help policymakers understand the financial and health impacts associated with climate policies. To do this, we first create a business as usual scenario, which is represented by this black line in the graph. This is created from a variety of national data sources and is a projection of emissions without any new policy. The model is forward simulating and uses an annual time step. 
Once we have a business as usual scenario, we can then apply policies to see how a policy would reduce forecasted greenhouse gas emissions. So in the example to the right, the colorful wedges represent different policies in this US NDC strategy. There's a few things about our model that are unique. Uh, one is it's a system dynamics model, which is really important for allowing us to assess the interactive impacts of different policies and to view them together as a package and see their combined effects. Our model is open source. It can be downloaded and run using free software. It's been extensively peer reviewed and it's based on reputable publicly available data. The model is economy wide and this includes the ability to produce outputs for economics and public health. The model covers the major demand sectors, industry and agriculture, buildings and transportation. Those feed into an electricity module and a district heat and hydrogen module. This allows us to model an increasing portion of hydrogen used as a fuel. We also have a CCS module, which can be applied to industry and electricity. We have a fuels module, which accounts for changes in fuel prices and emissions factors. And we have a research and development module, which can show how different technology can change outcomes. We have a land use module, and all of those sectors feed into our results, which are produced for pollutants. That includes both greenhouse gases and criteria air pollutants. This allows us to model associated health outcomes, like changes in premature mortality and asthma attacks. We also produce outputs for um, all of the different sectors in terms of changes in cash flows. These get fed into an input output model, which takes into account changes in output by industry and allows us to produce jobs and GDP outcomes by policy. Within each sector, things are further broken down. The building sector includes six different end uses and three different building types, rural residential, urban residential, and commercial. The industry sector covers more than 20 different industry categories, and we track energy use by many fuel types, as well as changes in jobs for each of these sectors. We have an electricity module that covers both renewable and non-renewable fuels. The power sector takes into account forecasted electricity demand, and then it can dispatch new capacity using these different fuel types. It takes into account fuel costs, capital costs, curtailment, and flexibility while bu building new capacity to meet energy demand. The transportation sector covers several different um, transportation vehicle types. We track vehicle stock for LDVs, HDVs, aircraft, rail, ships, and motorcycles, as well as across passenger and freight modes. We cover this for several vehicle technologies. And for the state models, we built up our database to um, use in the state modeling, primarily from data uh, produced by EIA and EPA. The electricity sector relies on EIA state electricity data and the building industry and transportation sectors rely on EIA state energy data systems for 2020. The industrial process emissions are from EPA's U.S. state-level non-CO2 greenhouse gas mitigation report, and the industrial process emissions are from EPA's state, excuse me, and the land use emissions are from EPA's state greenhouse gas inventories. Once we had the business as usual 2020 emissions, we forecasted emissions through 2050 for the states primarily relying on the annual energy outlook from EIA and NREL's 2017 electrification future study reference scenario. We rigorously calibrated the state EPS models to data from EPA, EIA, and Rhodium. And now that the models exist, they are easy to update and adapt. We can update the models in the future with new state level data 
and update the BAU scenarios when states pass new climate policies. I'm now gonna to switch to a demonstration of our model. This is the landing page for the EPS model. And here's the map of the different states. If you click on the upper right, we have a new documentation um, page that provides an introduction to the energy policy simulator model overall. It provides detailed instructions on how to download and use the model, methodology of the Venson model by sector, and then underneath model regions, we have the specific US state EPS methodology. This includes a detailed background of our forecasting methods and data sources. Underneath each state, you can uh, click a button to download the entire model. This includes all the underlying data, as well as the EPS model in Benson. To enter a state model online, you can click on a state from the map and then click enter simulator. This will bring you to the landing page for the state models, which show a business as usual forecast underneath this new scenario forecast in blue. If states have them, we included their existing greenhouse gas reduction targets. Up here, you can toggle between different graphs. So we produce a lot of outputs for the model and you can switch between them here, as well as the secondary drop down here. So for example, we can see emissions by sector broken down. On this left-hand side is where you can set policies. As an example, I'm gonna set an electricity sector policy. So you can click the drop down for electricity and select the policy you would like, which in this case, I'm gonna do a clean electricity standard. Click on the policy. You can click learn about this policy to find more information um, specific to the state. So we have some specific Colorado information in here, as well as a description of what this policy does. To create a new policy, you just drag the slider bar. Um, so I'm gonna put on 100% clean electricity policy. This will automatically um, phase in linearly, so it hits 100% by 2050. You can change that customization schedule by clicking Customize Implementation Schedule, click Add, and then add the year you want. So this will phase in the policy to 100% by 2030 instead of 2050, and you can see the implementation schedule graph update here. Once you click save, the model is gonna update in real time and you can see the emissions drop more quickly in your new scenario um, so that you're reaching that 100% goal by 2030. Your, um, you can record several policies here and they will be represented both down here and recorded up here by sector. I recommend you create an account that allows you to save your scenario and download the results from your scenario. Um, as an example, we include an NDC pathway policy package, which is a collection of policies that were developed to meet the US NDC targets. Um, just a couple graphs that are good to explore the policy results include this wedge diagram, which as I showed you in the PowerPoint, includes a contribution of different policies to the package. So in this case, we can see an electrification and hydrogen policy is uh, having a really substantial impact on this package, as well as a building electrification policy. These are organized um, by sector and color coded. So transportation is red, buildings are blue, blue green, um, electricity is gold, industry is blue, and green is land use and agriculture. I also recommend looking at the cost abatement curve, which represents the estimated cost per policy in net present value compared to the average annual abatement. As I mentioned in the PowerPoint, we produce financial outcomes, including changes in jobs and GDP using our input output model that's built in. This allows us to see changes, in different scenarios, across many different um, industry categories. Here they're summarized by fossil fuel and utility jobs, 
manufacturing and construction jobs and in other category, but there is a lot more detail available within um, the downloadable version of the model. As well as changes in jobs, you can see percent change in GDP. And in the NDC scenario, we see significant increase in GDP in Colorado. All of these results are within state, so they apply to jobs and changes in GDP within the state. Um, I also recommend looking at the human health and social benefits graphs, which can show the contribution of different policies to avoided premature mortality, as well as things like avoided asthma, asthma attacks and hospital admissions. And it's really impressive to see some of the NDC results having substantial effects on the health outcomes here. Um, the one other graph I would recommend looking at is electricity generation, which will show you a forecast of the electricity fuel mix through 2050. And you can see with our policies applied in NDC, this is switching to a mostly renewable and clean electricity fuel mix. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Nathan, who is going to uh, introduce some of the state projects we've been working on. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Olivia. I'm sharing my screen now. Olivia, can you see my screen? Awesome. Well, I am so excited to announce that the 48 state models have officially been released on February 6th, which includes the culmination of two and a half years of analytical firepower that we've we've sunk into this project. And on the right, you can see all 48 states that are now available, um, color-coded based on the sector, that has the most emissions in 2030. So one of the big reasons why we went through with this project was that developing state level policy packages to meet emission targets and to manage all of the trade-offs of many complicated multi-decadal multi-sector policy objectives can be very analytically challenging. Just the math alone of pulling all of this data and figuring out where we are and where we're going was a challenge that we experienced in a number of different geographies. And this powerful tool that Olivia has presented was one way to help demystify some of this analysis. I remember trying to, to solve whether or not a certain state was going to hit their target in graduate school and taking months to kind of just solve one sector because it gets very complicated very quickly. And with the EPS, with the Energy Policy Simulator, I was able to solve that same problem in hours. And some of our super users can solve those same questions in minutes. So it's a powerful tool to, to face a complicated and really pressing problem. And the release of these 48 state specific models can help solve this problem by helping users identify the largest sources of emissions by sector, fuel, and use, really getting into that granularity of where emissions are coming from. And then also using 60 policy levers to design and iterate on different scoping pathways, as well as evaluating policy packages that are being considered to decarbonize the overall economy. So we've pulled together all of these models, we've calibrated them, we have a bunch of data outputs. And so as a result, we started learning about which policies are most impactful in terms of driving down emissions. And we've collected them in kind of five key policy buckets across sectors that help all states, no matter kind of where their starting point is, um, drive down emissions and secure co-benefits. And so I'm gonna walk through those five policies right now. Uh, none of them are, are huge surprises, but we're gonna start with kind of the, the trusty clean electricity standard, also in many states called a renewable portfolio standard, which essentially states you know, drive a certain amount of clean electricity onto the grid. And so the, the target that we chose for this five um, key policy standard is 80% clean electricity by 2030 from a variety of sources and 100% by 2035. And these targets are designed to be ambitious and on the edge of the feasible. So clean electricity standard, number one. The next is the zero emission vehicle standard. So this includes electrification of vehicle fleets, as well as some hydrogen vehicles in sort of the, the heavy duty fleet. Um, but for this policy, it, it's looking at 100% sale 
of zero emission vehicles by 2035, which follows the California Advanced Clean Cars 2 rule. And I know you all um, know that the sequel is often better than the first, and we think this is an excellent policy. And the medium duty slash heavy duty um, target also follows the California Advanced Clean Truck Rule, which ramps up requirements to 100% sales by 2035 and 2045 for heavier trucks. For building codes and appliance standards targeting the direct combustion emissions within homes and buildings, the core policy is increasing standards that require electric-only equipment in new and existing buildings by 2035. So this is electrification of space heating, water heating, et cetera. For industrial emission standards, um, we're focusing on primarily replacing fossil fuels in certain key uses across a number of industries, which includes electricity or electrification for low heat processes, as well as a combination of electri electricity and hydrogen for medium and high temperature heat processes in a variety of industries. In addition, um, this, this kind of policy package for industrial emission standards includes fuel efficiency of about 5% improvement in the next decade, um, continuing up to 14% improvement by 2050. And these targets are based in part on studies that demonstrate how much efficiency is, is really feasible um, across a number of different um, in sectors. And then finally, standards for methane emissions, in particular leakage, and so this was based on sort of what is the 100% potential that EPA has identified in their non-CO2 data adjusted across all of the different states and calibrated based on sort of their baseline emissions and where emissions are coming from right now. So those are the five policies, and we can now see some of the results of those five policies in a number of example states. So we've, we've identified four key states that are diverse for a variety of reasons, just to demonstrate sort of how these five key policies um, sort of interact with, with the energy policy simulator. So to the left, you can see an output of the five key policies um, driving down emissions um, from the business as usual line, which is this dotted line on the top. Um, so it drives down into a, a separate policy scenario. And you can see in the Pennsylvania model, the clean electricity standard sort of is the main driver of emissions reductions out till 2050. The other four policies, of course, do have an impact, but the clean electricity standard is the most important in terms of emissions reductions. And that's largely because of the way that the, the grid is in Pennsylvania as of right now. There's a lot of emissions to drive down. And in Michigan, you can see that the clean electricity standard is also a, a major player, but the building code and appliance standard um, is also um, has, has an additional a large amount of emissions reductions due to the, the use of gas in, in those buildings in the colder climate. In Louisiana, where half, emission, half of the emissions come from the industrial sector, you can see that the industrial emission standard plays the key role. And in New Mexico, which has a lot of oil and gas production, you can see the standards for methane emissions is oversized relative to some of the other um, policies. So in addition, as Olivia mentioned, um, we're able to calculate sort of the jobs and co-benefits of these certain five policy um, um, scenarios and, and any policy for that matter um, to kind of understand, you know, with this kind of high level input output uh, model, what are the job impacts? And as you can imagine, the energy transition requires a lot of manufacturing, a lot of construction, a lot of new jobs. And so we can see that the direct impact of a lot of these policies is a net increase in manufacturing and construction jobs in 2030. And those jobs, often good paying, um, lead to sort of revitalization or additional indirect jobs um, in their community, which leads to an increase in other jobs, driving up overall employment in a given state by, the, by nature of this, this level of investment. And in addition, less pollution equals less public health benefits. Again, we have this data across all 48 states for, for some of this, but just to, to flag a couple, you can see that reducing the combustion of fossil fuels and the associated pollution with it can, um, can measurably reduce avoided premature deaths um, by you know, low hundreds to mid hundreds in 2030 and multiple hundreds of folks by 2050. So there are real health impacts and we're learning more about those health impacts each and every year as more studies come out. 
So this is kind of a high level um, estimate based on the criteria pollutants that the model is, is calculating. And so I'm also gonna provide three real life examples of how we used the energy policy simulator in a variety of different ways. So this first example, quantifying the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan and is, an, is an example of not energy innovation and RMI using these tools, but another climate advocacy group using these tools to answer a key question that they had. So the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan was released in April of 2022 and was a plan to cut emissions. It was you know, released into the world and Five Lakes Energy wanted to understand using the energy policy simulator, how far would that plan get the state to their 2030 climate target? And so they worked with the Michigan Environmental Council, NRDC, RMI and Energy Innovation, but, but really led this project to quantify the impact of this plan. And they found, and you can see on the chart to the right, that this plan was effective at reducing emissions, but did not quite achieve the 2030 target, requiring additional policy if that goal were to be achieved. And so additional effective options that they used the EPS to scope out included halting construction of new gas-fired power plants and strong building electrification and EV sales standards. So you can think of this this as you know, evaluating a plan that is in the world and you want to understand by magnitude how effective it is at achieving a given target. But you can also use the EPS to create your own plan. And so um, entering the, Louis the Louisiana's Climate Action Task Force. So they created a task force in order to determine a pathway to achieve the governor's goal of reaching net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. And they used the policy simulator in order to scope out different options in order to better understand how to actually achieve that goal. And so policies with the highest emissions abatement from this process included industrial electrification and hydrogen fuel switching, low carbon or no carbon hydrogen production, and a clean electricity standard. So these are policies that are very aligned with the five policy package that I mentioned before. And you can see to the right, the combination of all these policies calculated by the EPS, um, driving the state closer to their 2050 goal. So this is kind of scoping out and, and designing a policy package. And then you can also use the outputs or the data from the EPS in order to provide concise, clear, or accessible insights into where the state stands right now and where are they going. So we released these state scorecards, which covered six large front runner states including Colorado, Illinois, New Jersey, um, Washington, California, New York. And so the, the concept here was to, to kind of identify, okay, how much progress has a state made in 2020? How much progress will they make in 2030 if you calculate all of the currently passed policies? And how does that break down via by each sector? And you can see sort of in the, the Colorado scorecard, um, the economy-wide metric um, is, is looking pretty good, and you can see that the electricity metric is really aligned with or targeting um, the, the climate-aligned range, but you can see that there's more work to be done, for example, in buildings or industry, those, those blue bunnies representing sort of the culmination of all of their policies in 2030 as calculated by the energy policy simulator. So we did this for six large leading states, and this um, this information was featured in the New York Times front page story featuring state level climate efforts. So in conclusion, and these are just a couple examples of how we've used this tool, but the state level decarbonization pathway calculations can be challenging and there are years of accumulated policy, complicated targets, many sectors and across decades in complex technologies and the release of these 48 public state EPS models allows for state level decision makers, advocates, the public to chart out decarbonization pathways to meet the climate goals. For so long, this conversation has been um, mostly in the hands of fancy think tanks and expensive consultancy groups, um, but the most effective way forward is to have more people in the room able to have the conversation of how to chart the path forward. We've identified five key policies across sectors that effectively reduce emissions and maximize co-benefits. And we have seen the state EPS models already be, um, have already been used to evaluate decarbonization plans, scope future options, and to take this data and produce it into new products that help people understand the energy transition. And what we really hope to see and look forward to see 
is many more groups using this powerful tool beyond just our groups in more states for more use cases and more creative ideas in order to build that intuition of what it takes to decarbonize a given state's economy. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you so much, Olivia. And we have a few other folks from EI and RMI on the call who also help us answer some questions. Um, Zach and Robbie, if you, when you answer a first question, if you would just introduce yourself as well, that would be really helpful. So let me see, where should we start? Um, there is a great question. I think Rachel Golden asked a really interesting question. Let me find it now. It was, if I recall, it was about the jobs figures and if the jobs figures were in aggregate or if they could actually be broken down by policy. So who would like to take that one? I'll take that one. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so hey, everyone. I'm Robbie Orvis. I'm the Senior Director for Modeling and Analysis at Energy Innovation. Um, and yeah, Rachel, great question. Um, and there's a similar question related to kind of the input output model generally and how it works. Um, so both of these are, are similar. So let's do both. Um, so the EPS includes uh, an embedded input output model downstream of all of the policy and energy impacts. Um, it's a, not a specific model that we couple with. It's actually included in the model itself. It is um, based on the deeper model that was uh, produced by ACEEE, um, and we owe a lot of thanks to folks there who helped us put it together over the years. Uh, and it includes over different over forty different sectors of the economy. Um, so, for example, coal mining is its own sector. Electrical equipment, for example, there's there's a whole bunch of there of different industries there. Um, and so in the online version of the tool, we aggregated a lot of sectors into kind of macro sectors just for readability, because otherwise you get a 40 different lines on a chart gets difficult to read. Um, but in the downloadable version of the tool, you can see the um, all the data for all those different industries, and you could also test things by policy. So if you wanted to just look at the effect on a specific industry from a specific policy, um, you can do that. Um, and the tool, um, as Olivia mentioned, is freely available and you can download it and run it with free software. Um, and we have some training videos to do that as well that we can share um, with folks if you if you want those afterwards. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit about the input output model that's included. And um, I guess the last thing I'll say is we include for folks familiar with those direct, indirect and induced job uh, and uh, GDP changes, and you can look at each uh, version of those as well. So there's a ton of detail and um, granularity available in the in the downloadable version. Thanks, Robbie. Um, and we had another question about interaction effects. Let me pull that up here. Um, you guys are all asking, everyone's asking wonderful questions. Thank you. So from Tim Miller, he asks, when policies have interaction effects, how, how do you decide which policy you attribute the benefits? Yeah, I'll take that one too. Um, thanks, Tim. Great question. Uh, so uh, we use an approach that, uh, so what we do is we turn on all of the policies at once. So um, the, let's just say you have a policy that, um, that is an incentive. Let's say you have the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, that creates an incentive for electric vehicle adoption. And then let's say we're looking at a state that is also going to pass a zero emissions vehicle standard like California's Advanced Clean Cars 2 rule. So we would turn both of those on and look at the combined effect of the policy. And then what we do is we turn one of those pieces off and look at the change. Then we turn it back on and we turn the other one off and we look at the change. And that lets us understand kind of the relative magnitude of each of the policies within that sector. And then after we do that, if you just sum those two things, they don't always uh, sum up to the total because of different policy interactions. So we rescale the reductions from each so that we get the same numbers when they're both turned on. So the exercise for doing this across the whole economy um, gets a bit more complicated, but we kind of focus in on each sector we, we look at everything together, we toggle off individual elements, and then that gives us an idea of the importance of each of those elements um, within the context of all the other 
policies and that's how we that's how we get more information on the on the importance of different policies thanks robbie um someone asked to i'll just answer this um about the presentation slide so Anybody who registered will get a recording and you also get a copy of the presentation slides and any links that were, you'll be able to see the links that were in the presentation as well. So um, Michael has a question about using the Minnesota EPS to show the effects of the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill. Um, and they're wondering how best to do a BAU versus implementing the IRA at full effect, and if the IRA is already incorporated. And then a follow-up question, since Minnesota just passed their 100% by 2040 law, good job, Minnesota, and thank you, uh, Michael, if you were working on that, um, is that already incorporated or when would that be incorporated? I can take part of that. Um, so the Minnesota model was published right before uh, you all passed your law requiring 100% clean energy. So it doesn't currently include that, but we can update that pretty easily, like I mentioned in the model. Um, so I think we could expect to do that in the next couple months and feel free to email me as a follow-up if you'd like to know exactly when we can publish that. Um, in terms of the IRA, the models do not currently include policies from the IRA. That is something we're working on um, and we're trying to you know, accurately integrate the effects of the IRA into the state models. Um, and that will probably you know, take a few months to ensure we're doing that correctly, but it is something we hope to do soon. Thanks, Olivia. Any follow-ups from anyone else on the team? Great. All right, Glenn is asking a question about uh, if the federal government required electrical power to decarbonize at 5% per year, uh, for example, 40% clean today, 45% after year one, 50% after year two, et cetera, um, then some states would gain jobs. Do you have a list of these? So we, we don't have a list off, off the bat, but it would be possible in order to take, say, a clean electricity standard or to a policy similar to that and go through each of the models and sort of run that policy and understand the job's impact. And so internally, we have some tools that can do sort of this, this cross-cutting work. If there's a subset of states that you'd have a hypothesis on, um, then you know, that would be certainly doable. I think that in general, um, at least near term for something that drives a large amount of construction of new capex that would in general drive jobs in most states. And that's kind of what we are seeing with our original analysis, but I'll open to the floor to my colleagues um, as well to, to kind of explain that process. And when we did a first pass, maybe not a 5%, but but sort of the, the more ambitious um, kind of 80% by, by 2030 analysis, we saw job increases in um, all of the states that we've, we've analyzed. Okay. I'm going to ask a question now from Layla, and uh, this is about, have we incorporated local laws into the model in addition to state laws? For instance, in New York, local laws applicable to the city are major drivers of the emissions reductions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, kind of like I said in the presentation, the models are really adaptable. So I think if you would like to make a customization to account for something like that in the future, um, we could support you in, in doing that. And um, the data is fully accessible. So you can download the entire model update it with the expected, you know, change in natural gas heating demand in your state based on the new policy and rerun the model to get the results. Um, and yeah, if you ever need help with that, feel free to reach out to our team and we can try to support you. And to add on to that, I think a lot of the time it doesn't have to necessarily be a state policy. 
um, if you want to model something out onto the tool, you could even start with saying, okay, local law, it applies to New York City. New York City has this, this level of size. And you can kind of convert that into a, a projection of what that will do to driving electrification or efficiency as a proportion of the overall state, and then put that into to one of the levers of the model. And we've done that in the past for the local law when we were evaluating New York's specific policy. Um, but you can kind of do some sensitivity analysis and sort of think of, okay, this is what we think the projection is and use the tool, that aggregated state level tool as a way to kind of see the overall impacts of those types of policies. So you can you could find workarounds in order to, to get the answer or, or the analysis that you're looking for. Great, thanks Nathan. So here's a, another question about customizing data. So um, Naraj asks, can you customize the modules or data uh, sources, particularly um, the costs of solutions, the change in costs of solutions? Yeah, so almost all of the data underlying the model um, should be pretty straightforward to customize and update, including some of the cost data and some of the elasticity values used in the economic modeling. Um, the structure of the model itself is fixed in the version we use, um, and it's not, you're not able to change like the specific modules in the Venson reader. However, if you want to become a, a Venson user, you can. Um, use Vensim and you can, you know, change the model um, how you wish, and it's completely open source. So you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but all of the underlying data is um, easily changeable. It's in an Excel format or a CSV format. Okay. Let's see. Um, Michael is just responding and saying, um, can you please consider providing a way to enter a set of basic IRA policy assumptions? I know the IRA is a huge set of policies, but a rough model would be very helpful. Anyone want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. So we also want to be able to do that. <laughs> um, and so, um, there are a few things that have to happen. One is we're all awaiting treasury guidance to, better understand how to interpret uh, the IRA impacts. Um, so that's one piece. And as more information on that comes out in the coming months, um, we expect to have a better handle on how to incorporate that. The other is that um, uh, as many folks on the call are probably familiar with the, this approach of incentives and programs at the scale uh, that the IRA is, is uh, pretty new um, for the US. And so um, we are working on some updates to our model um, in terms of kind of the underlying structure of the model to be able to um, capture the anticipated effects of the IRA much better. So you can imagine, um, you know, looking at the level of incentives for tax credits for electric clean electricity, for example, and how that catalyzes deployment Similarly, for hydrogen, where we haven't really had a market for hydrogen, we're trying to better understand how the incentives will drive hydrogen growth and then how we can model that. So um, it's not that we uh, we don't we we are all in the same boat. We want to be able to understand this better at the state level, um, but we we're awaiting more information and then also working on those kind of structural updates so that we can get um, a much more accurate picture that we feel confident in um, at the state level in the future. So hopefully, hopefully later this year, um, perhaps within the next six months, we, we might be ready to, to roll those out, but depends on a few different moving pieces. Thanks, Robbie. And I'll just um, plug our newsletter. If you go to energyinnovation.org, I would normally pop it in the chat, but if you sign up for our updates on Follow Us, you'll know whenever we have new updates to any of the energy policy simulator models. So that's a good way to stay in touch and up to date with us on those, on those things. So, okay, I'm gonna go back to a question that we answered in chat, but I think is helpful to answer live um, from Chris. And Chris asks, elsewhere you lumped ag and industry together. And when you talk about industry here, does that include ag? And then he also asked, and if ag is not included in these five policies, 
since it does contribute substantial emissions, why not? Was it the difficulty or what? why not? I'm happy to answer that policy and then, and then toss it to the rest of the panelists. But the, the agriculture segment of the energy policy simulator is, is sort of separated in, in, um, in the policy framework. I think that when we were designing this, this five policies, we were definitely looking on things that worked extremely cross-cutting across all of the different states. But this is not a comprehensive list. What we are not saying is do these five things and you are done and you have solved um, the, the climate change policy framework in your state. What we are saying is that these five policies across every state are likely going to have a significant impact. So, you know, obviously agriculture and especially sort of those associated emissions with literal agricultural practices, the methane um, and, and a number of the other associated greenhouse gases are important to achieving your climate targets. And those are something that the model tracks and contains. But when we were looking at our five policies, we were kind of trying to find, you know, the, the most major across all state policies that kind of hit those major policy buckets. And I think that the, the methane um, emissions piece also kind of targets some of those agricultural um, those, those agricultural sources, um, which are important to manage. But, but for sure, this is not a completely comprehensive look at everything that needs to be done in order to achieve net zero. And just for reviewing some of the agriculture results separately than industry, um, yes, we do track it separately than industrial sector emissions, and you can see um, agriculture specific results in the drop downs. Um, so, for example, the first one, which is emissions and CO2E, if you go to the right, um, there's a drop down that has agriculture specific emissions trends. Um, you can also dig into more detail of that in the downloadable version of the tool. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to comment? There's been a few questions just about, you know, how we settled on these five policies when there might be other types of policies that could be effective, perhaps carbon pricing. Sure, I'll I'll start there. Um, so yeah, I think Nathan uh, Nathan hinted at it, which is we were looking for policies that we felt um, were broadly applicable. So that's why, for example, we don't have some, we don't have ag in there, not because it's not important, but because in some states there, there are almost no agricultural emissions like in Louisiana. Um, and then we were also just looking at, um, you know, policies that have been widely deployed for the most part or in sectors where they haven't been kind of what what's needed there. So you see things like zero emissions vehicle standards, which builds on, for example, the advanced clean cars rules and the advanced clean trucks rules that a lot of states have adopted. Um, carbon pricing is in the model and you can test it. Um, you know, speaking for our work, um, just with everything that's in the IRA, we see uh, in this research note, we felt it was important to highlight some of the other policies that, um, you know, capture the economic tailwinds of the IRA um, and will kind of ensure that states uh, take advantage of those. And so we landed on the set of policies that we did. Thanks, Robbie. Um, we're getting towards the end. So I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions. There was a question about equity analysis. Does anybody wanna talk a bit about some of the metrics we do include around equity um, and how we're thinking about that? Um, sure, I can take that. Um, we do track um, some of the kind of equity related outcomes, particularly um, the health outcomes. Those are reported in terms of both total and by race. Um, so I would recommend kind of looking at the drop downs on the web tool there. Um, inside the tool, we also track some of the like cash flow data. Um, and some of the like more specific policy, like you could do one policy like a building equipment standard and look at the changes in cash flows and see um, you know, who that's gonna cost more money, who that's gonna save more money. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for doing equity related analysis there um, in addition to some of the health outcomes we have on the um, online version of the tool. Thanks, Olivia. I know there was a question about input output 
models. Um, and I'm not saying exactly what it was, but Robbie, did you? Yeah, I think there was kind of a question just how we how we created the state versions of the input output models. Um, and I will say that uh, it, it took a very long time to get to a point where we felt confident in the results. Um, and it's too much to go through entirely, but but briefly, we start with um, uh, state level data on what's called value added, which is the same as um, gross domestic output or GDP that the federal government has. Um, and then we use some um, methodologies from other models, including um, there's a model called RIMS, which is how the Bureau of Economic Analysis looks at labor impacts. There's another model called Implan, and we borrowed some methodologies from that. Um, and the methodologies from those other models and some other sources allow us to go from state level um, value added and convert that to um, output, like sales of different things, um, and uh, wages and jobs. Um, so uh, it took a long time to get that working correctly and also to be able to correctly assess kind of the share of um, in-state purchases. So for, for example, if someone goes and buys um, cement to work on a facility or to work on their house to um, for us to be able to kind of understand, okay, how much of that state was produced, how much of that cement was produced within a state and how much was imported with, um, to the state. Um, and so that um, that was also part of the process. So it, it took a while. Um, the methodologies are um, documented online. And then also we're happy to, to answer more detailed questions and kind of how we did that um, if folks want to reach out directly. Thanks, Robbie. I think this will be our last question. But just a reminder, if you have any other further questions, you can just email us at policy at energyinnovation.org. And if you're interested in using the model in your state, we would also be happy to, to chat with you about that. So you can email us about that as well. So this last question from Carrie asks if there are if there's a way to see different forms of electric heating, like air source heat pumps versus resistance heat versus networked geothermal. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we would really like to have that in the model and we're currently working on it, but we don't currently. So we currently track end use and fuel types. So we have kind of total electricity used for space heating, total natural gas used for space heating, but we don't currently track appliance type. Um, we are hoping to switch to using a stock turnover model for some of these building sector end uses. Um, and it is something we're working on this year, so forthcoming. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day. And uh, just a reminder, this will be sent out to you in about 24 hours, the recording and the slides. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. And we look forward to working with you on climate policy. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>